Hello, this is Marshall LaCour, and I am the host of Listen Up Men. And today I am so delighted to have Dr. Jerome with me here live in Facebook land. Dr. Jerome, welcome. Welcome yourself to Trinidad. Thank you very much for having me here on your show, Masha. Listen, let's just jump right in. Tell us exactly who you are, what kind of work you do, and the current project that you're involved with on a global scale. My name is Jerome Tiloxing. I'm from a small island in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago. I am a lecturer in the history department at the University of the West Indies. I've been teaching there for about 12 years. And before I taught at university, I taught at secondary schools and I saw a problem in that many of our men were being stereotyped and demonized. There was this stigma that men were perpetrators of violence, that men were absentee fathers, they were involved in crime. And when I started my graduate work, I became involved as a sort of recreation pastime in some activism, which became almost full-time in that I started to promote International Men's Day in November, 1999, I revived it. And from that day, just spread via social media. And I'm just amazed now to see that Canada, thanks to the group in Toronto, comprising Diane Oja Ali and her team, it has taken off. We have people from Dave, like David Hatfield in Vancouver area. So I'm really glad to see Canada is on board, but I'm also glad to see that the men in Canada are on board. And so what yeah. got you involved with this, besides the stereotyping of the young boys? Was there any other catalyst in your life that really inspired you to get so deeply involved with this, with your vision? Yes, it's my dad's birthday, the 19th of November. And he is a role model, not just for me and my brother and sister, but also in the community and the nation. So I felt that, you know, um, instead of looking to Hollywood or to somewhere else, if I look at my dad, other people will start looking at their dad, their uncles, stepfather, adopted father. So I felt that there was a need to look within the family unit or the extended family for a role model. It could even also be in the classroom, a good teacher. Well, you said you taught high school. Correct. I taught high school for about four years. And then you moved on to a higher education. Correct. Well, there's a bit of a feedback here. Can you hear it at your end? I am here and fine. I'm here and fine, yes. Okay. And now tell us, what is your vision for the uh, going global with this organization, with this movement? This movement, my vision is for it to transcend boundaries. I'm concerned about ensuring that it isn't just for men. I'm also ensuring that boys are taking part. I'm ensuring that girls and women also see the need to support, to help our men. So I don't want it just to be seen or misinterpreted as being something that is anti-female or you know anti-woman. So I'm trying to ensure that it cross those gender barriers. I'm also trying to ensure that cultural, religious, class, geographical boundaries are being crossed. My vision is for it to continue influencing and impacting on the grassroots organizations. I don't want to just be a movement from the top with the governments or ministries involved. I want it to be down with the common man, with the people. So that is my vision for it. And so what is the connection between the organization and the UN? There's very little connection in that in the past, some United Nations organizations in some countries would have a men's day observance or they would observe the day of the boy child on the 16th of May, but they have not fully endorsed it because some country, my country, hopefully, they have to put it for a vote on the United Nations agenda, which when they meet annually, but my country hasn't done it yet because of a change in governments. 
And so do you see in the future that you will have that connection with the UN? I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that it will be on the official calendar. But I'm so glad you brought that up because often we look to justify and recognize a day, we look to acknowledge a day once it's so-called officially on the UN calendar. But I'm very blessed and lucky that my day hasn't been on the calendar, but people have seen the need to have an observance and to highlight these issues. You know, so I it shows that here I have a challenge. It's not on the UN calendar, but it has spread globally to more than 80 countries. And that just shows you that there's our men are in crisis, our boys, and we are trying to help them, trying to empower them. So really it has taken off at a grassroots level. Correct. It has started off here. It has spread in the Caribbean globally. I'm very happy to see that it's not just in developing countries, the global south, it has spread to developed countries. Developed countries where the men's movement is so developed and vibrant. And it's a very important um, time I'm seeing where we are witnessing the emergence of the Me Too movement. We are seeing other movements happening. We are seeing feminism, you know, also becoming a bit aggressive. So it has taken off at a time when I think men needs a movement like this. Now, what do you see from your perspective is the connection between the organization that you're currently supporting globally and the Me Too movement? How can those two work together? How can both work hand in hand? It's a very interesting question because right now, if you ask persons on the street, they will tell you that the Me Too movement might be interpreted as a sort of witch hunt. It might be seen as an arm of the feminism, an arm of the feminist movement, where they're trying to accuse men, you know, that you're, you're, in, you're involved in sexual harassment or you're involved in um, rape or these accusations. So my movement is more about empowering men, looking at the positive aspects. The Me Too movement might be seen as something anti-man or anti-boy, anti-male, but the Me Too movement also will strike a chord because it means that men have to improve their lives. Men have to now live up to expectations. Men also now have to ensure that we don't allow a minority of men to tarnish or to tar all the men. There might be some men who might be guilty, but we cannot just stereotype and make a generalization and say all the men are guilty. So there is potential for the both movements to work together. But right now, the Me Too movement, it sort of makes the, the men appear as bad and evil. Now, from your perspective, what do you see are some of the issues globally for the young boys in the world? Some of the issues facing our young boys include depression, bullying, um, aggression. Some of them experience peer pressure at schools and the homes. Some of these boys are, are victims because they are attracted to gangs. Some of these boys sometimes lack role models. But I feel one of the major problems is the, the lack of emotional diversity. Two years ago, there was an article in the Scientific American magazine talking about boys who are afraid to express their emotion. The society expects boys to express anger, and that is seen as natural. And girls, females have this freedom to express their emotions, but boys, they don't have that emotional spectrum. They are limited. So I see that as one of the challenges facing our boys. And as a result of that, the month of January has been, uh, has a special meaning about it. What is that globally, the month of January? The United States International Men's Day team, headed by Miss Diane Says, she has, about three years ago, she took this initiative to have a global men and boys emotional freedom month. And she came up with themes. This year, the theme is about ending the silence, suicide and depression, two very important issues. So 
I am very grateful that she has teamed up with the International Men's Day Movement to try to ensure that the boys and the men are able to express their emotions freely. Because I'll tell you something, a man who is emotionally hurt will be afraid to speak out because it will be seen as a sign of weakness. And you know, Masha, that sometimes boys or men might be sexually abused and they will not find proper counseling. Psychological and psychiatric counseling and treatment is often not available for our boys and men who might be abused physically or sexually or emotionally. So I think that this is a problem we need to address in this month. And I'm very thankful that we have our entire month dedicated for this. Well, certainly, you know, we feel, we've seen a lot of emotional abuse and sexual abuse with young boys uh, in with clerical staff, i.e. priests within the Catholic Church and perhaps other Christian institutions. And this has been going on for years, and a number of these young boys are now coming forward many years later and speaking outright and saying, I'm a victim, I'm taking a stand, I need help and I need support. What are you going to do to help me? Yeah. And I think this is where we shouldn't just expect governments to help. The community, non governmental organizations need to establish centers, health centers, medical centers, drop in centers. You would know in Canada, we have, you all have homes or shelters for women who are battered physically physically battered, abused women. But we need to have shelters for men, drop-in centers where men could come in, men who can't afford treatment, they could get counseling, they could get a brochure, they could get, if they need money. So I think this is what we need to do at the community level. We need to have these centers where men could come and openly express their feelings without fear of being ridiculed or victimized. Well, that's a, that's a great idea. I mean, that's a very practical, down-to-earth, grassroots step to give these young boys, or, who are probably now men, and younger boys maybe are two are still being sexually abused, to get the help that they need. Yeah. Because trauma, if not dealt with over the long term, causes severe consequences. I also want to add that apart from the emotional abuse and the psychological and sexual, there are thousands of child soldiers, young boys who are forced to go into war. They are forced to carry arms. And this war, these wars, these conflicts, wherever it may be in the world, it creates emotional and psychological scars for these boys. And you would know, adult veterans who come back from the war, they also suffer from mental stress. So we also want to focus on, on the issue of war and conflicts, how it affects our men and boys. And so what do you envision for this month in a practical way? I envision in a practical way that firstly, we will have campaigns. We will have a blitz, a campaign blitz, where we could target not just social media, but we will get a radio, we will get newspapers involved, we will get a television to have advertisements. We will be able to sensitize the public. We will be able to influence political leaders. I'm also hoping that this month and this global campaign will be in, able to influence international organizations. We would be able to write a letter or send a note to NATO, United Nations, or maybe NAFTA, and tell them that a trade agreement is affecting, is creating um, an economic depression, affecting our men, the wars in Europe, the wars in Africa, as a result of foreign intervention, it's affecting the men and boys. So I want us to, in the long run, to be able to reach out to international organizations, community groups, governments, and show them that the grassroots, the public, they are concerned. Too often our men are voiceless. And I am hoping that my campaign will be that voice for men who are crying out for help. They are crying out for peace in the world. And so what do you see Canada's role in, in this campaign to support you? 
I think Canada is playing a very crucial and a critical role in that you all in Canada, you all are multi-ethnic, multicultural, you are diverse. And you would know and your listeners and viewers that almost two weeks ago, you all welcomed a refugee, a young woman from Saudi Arabia. And that is remarkable. From my research, I've also found out that during slavery in the United States, many refugee slaves, these enslaved Africans, came to Canada. And some of you all might know about the Underground Railroad. So Canada has always embraced refugees. And I am hoping that Canada will also embrace this idea of helping our men, helping our boys, the same way that Canada has opened up policy to help refugees, to help people in need and protect them. I'm hoping that you all will be become a, one of the role model countries for Men's Day and that in every province, in every city, there'll be a Men's Day observance that will reflect a caring initiative. I studied at University of Guelph. I did my master's degree in history and I was very impressed in the way that you all have created a society that is not just so diverse, but you all have removed barriers. And this is what International Men's Day is about. It's about removing barriers, you know, and I, I admire Canada for that, that so many countries, you all would know your next door neighbor is planning to build a wall. And you yeah. all in Canada here, you all have embraced, you know, so many people who are looking for asylum, they are looking for a home. And this is what Men's Day is about. It's trying to create comfort, trying to embrace others who are in need. And you said that we, you want the support of the females. How can we as females support your movement to support the men and the boys? Correct. As females, all I think the men want is sometimes they want a listening ear. They just want someone to hear their problems because often men speak, but nobody listens. So I think that sometimes our men want support. They want a listening ear. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes our men and boys, they just need a comforting word. They just need a word of encouragement. I saw an article from Psychology Today, a magazine, and it spoke about the way mothers interact with their sons and daughters. And it said that when mothers interact with their daughters, there is more emotional vocabulary. But when it's time to react, interact with the son, there's more the emotion of anger. So I think that I want our women, our girls, to, to be more open-minded when it comes to our men. Don't just you know, see our men pigeonhole us, stereotype us as you know, being liars or being evil or being abusers. I want our boy, girls, our females, to be more supportive of our men. You know, too often, I would give you an example, there might be a divorce and often it goes into the court system and immediately the courts blame the men for the marriage breaking up and they, the men often are sometimes innocent victims. So I think we need the females, if we could be more supportive of our men, you know, sometimes a, a positive word could help. And I think a positive word or being more understanding could help diffuse a potential argument, a potential debate in the home, or in the school, or in the situation, any situation. So I think that is where I would want to, you know, leave it there because as you would know, gender inequality and gender inequity is a very real problem. You know, often I would, I've spoken to feminists, I've spoken to females, and I would ask them about this situation. I say, how could we overcome the situation? And sometimes the women would feel powerless and they would say, well, it's all about patriarchy. You know, I, <laughs> it's difficult now to carry on a conversation if we use patriarchy as that wall to separate us, you know? So I feel that is where I would want to leave it, you know, that we, we be more understanding, more collaboration, you know? From your point of view, how important is health and wellness for men and young boys? I believe that health and wellness is so critical. And that health and wellness 
it has a diverse broad spectrum physically mentally emotionally psychologically spiritually a man has to be healthy if a man has an ailment it could be depression it could be cancer it could be diabetes it will influence his emotions if a man he experiences a death of a loved one if a man experiences job loss because of unemployment or retrenchment he will express that emotion somehow and he needs an outlet so i feel that that health and wellness is so critical to create the holistic man the man who is healthy in all spheres of his life and once you have a healthy man you will have a healthy female you will have a healthy family you will have a healthy neighborhood it's a positive repercussion very much so very much so do you want to comment on the current educational system as far as boys being socialized in elementary and high school levels and maybe even college and university is there a need there for change at the, at those levels from your point of view definitely a hundred percent there's a need for change and i will tell you some of my obs observations in which you all might also experience in canada at the kindergarten level at the primary school level the preschool level i am noticing that there are hardly male teachers kindergarten or nursery level it's mostly female teachers and here in the caribbean they are mostly female teachers in our secondary schools our high schools our colleges and i'm also noticing that many of the graduates from my university and universities in north america and abroad are more females the females have now become the overachievers they now hold not just degrees mbas they are holding top positions they are becoming the new ceos they have they have broken the glass ceiling that proverbial glass ceiling so there is a crisis because many boys do not want to study too much they might appear as nerds they might be labeled as effeminate by their friends so sometimes and Marsha, you might know that that cartoon character bart simpson bart simpson is always somebody who is playful somebody who is always putting a prank in school he doesn't want to settle down his sister lisa is the studious one she is playing a musical instrument she is the good girl and those images of bart and lisa they are not just fictional they are very much a reality they reflect a reality of our schooling system where our boys are hoping that they could get a good job maybe in the so-called boys club they are hoping that somebody will give them a job no matter of their education or merit or qualifications so i'm seeing that there is a crisis in our education system in the caribbean it might also be so in north america and europe and the rest of the world but there is definitely a crisis where we are having a family now where the female has become the new breadwinner and that i think is a reversal of roles that could create potential conflicts within the family home now do you think both male and female within the family home could be both breadwinners together they could be breadwinners together and often they are but as i was like trying to explain just now often the wife or the partner the female partner brings home more money she's the higher income earner because she's more qualified because when she was at university she appreciated the value of education she was stable whereas the boy was busy with the sports he was busy liming with his friends so i think this is where the problem comes in she maybe has to when she gets married at a later age in life maybe she has to pay the greater share for the mortgage or the loan so this is where we are seeing now a reversal of roles where the man might feel emasculated he might feel inferior because he's earning less and i'll tell you something i've noticed too in our classrooms often the teachers ignore the boys who are being rebellious or disobedient or disruptive some of the teachers focus on those students or those girls who are willing to learn so right there in the classroom 
we need to rectify this situation. We need to change that scenario so that boys will understand and appreciate the value of knowledge. Now, from your point of view, what is an ideal healthy male in all spheres of life? What does that look like in everyday life? <laughs> you ask a very good question. It is, it is difficult to pinpoint and give a particular example. Because if I give a particular example of a healthy male, it might not be so for other men. And why I'm saying that is that I want your viewers and listeners to appreciate that when we talk about men and masculinity, we have to move away from that narrative and understand and use the term now masculinities. There are different types of masculinities. A healthy masculinity for me might be emotional and physical stability. A healthy masculinity for somebody else might be a psychological stability. For me, a healthy male might be somebody who might be in a family unit, right, with a wife and children. For other people, other persons, a healthy male might be a single man who has a job and he's living a happy life and he enjoys being single. He might have a partner or a girlfriend. So it, it is difficult to create a narrative and say, this is what the healthy male should be. Because if I do that, or if anybody do that, you are excluding other men and boys who are living perfectly happy and normal lives. So the very term healthy, the very term happy, the very term normal will have different meanings because the term masculinity has become more or less a term that is extinct. We, I have used the term masculinities because we have a broad spectrum of men and masculinities. There's a lot of diversity in masculinity. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Well, it does. So you, you sort of, you you sort of expanded the context of what it means to be a healthy male. Correct. And what I should also tell you that men who have gone, men in the present and men in the future, it is very difficult to to reach that ideal of a healthy male and keep it, because we live in a world that is so fast paced and changing so much. Today I might be a healthy male. Next week, I might be sick next month, and then I, will become, I could become healthy again. So it is not something that is, you know, fixed. It is not something static. It is constantly changing with society. Right, it's dynamic. Correct. That is the correct word, dynamic, yeah. And so when will you be coming to Toronto? Or Canada to see us. <laughs> Probably in the warmer, warmer, warmer months of, of the year. But I was there last November. Yes. This your men's day observance in Etobicoke, and it was wonderful to be there in Canada to reconnect with some friends. And um, again, at that men's day observance last November, it was a crowd where I saw that ethnic and religious diversity I just talked to you about. And I will tell you a little story and the others who were there would support it. I actually met a refugee from that Mohinga crisis. You know that crisis where the, the Muslims are uh, being um, stereotyped and they have to flee? I actually met a refugee from that crisis there and I had a little conversation with him. So it was just amazing to be there, you know, to meet the Canadians and to see the enthusiasm for this idea and to see that it isn't something that I'm keeping hidden away. It is something that I've shared and there's so much potential in Canada for this men's data spread. And I have to say, I heard you speak at the Men and Masculinity Conference that morning. Thanks very much. Yeah, it was it was fabulous. Yeah, yeah. That that also was a great event there. At, I believe it was at the Marriott, the morning yes. of the event. And um, yes. that was a fantastic event because I was also able to appreciate masculinity from different viewpoints. You know, I was able to appreciate how we could develop strategies, how we could develop campaigns. So I'm seeing some good signs 
you know, for collaboration. And I, I think that the future is in good hands. I, I sense that. Well, it's so great having you here today. Is there any final words that you want to leave for men and boys today for this special month? Yeah, I just want to leave the message that our men and boys, they are being empowered. There is a bright future ahead. There will be some dark days. There will be some gloomy times. But I want our men and boys throughout the world to know that we are behind them. And I want to. I want to see a future. I want to see a world. It might sound idealistic. It might sound unreal. But I want to see a world where issues like suicide and depression, rapes, murders, domestic violence will disappear. I want to see a world where we could live in harmony. You know, I don't want to wait until for another time. I want to see it now. I want to see this new world being created and i want to see canada to be part of this new environment an environment of love an environment of caring an environment of harmony and again Marsha, thank you for for giving me this opportunity dr charlie i loved having you here today look forward to seeing you here in canada soon blessings to you blessings to you and all your viewers and listeners thank you so much